so welcome everybody to the um you know the next uh, seminar uh in our uh, research uh, research cluster um uh, modernity in central asia um uh, identity society and environment and um it is a pleasure uh, for me to uh, moderate today's uh, discussion with uh, the uh, with Peter Wagner as a uh, you know the presenter today. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Peter is uh, already well known for the major the majority of you, and I uh, am very pleased to see that um, in uh, among our attendees today, we have not only the uh, people from uh, the University of Central Asia, uh, but from elsewhere. So for example, I see Irene here as a, as a panelist. Welcome Irene to, the, uh, to, this, um, uh, to this talk. Um, anyway, uh, well, uh, Professor Wagner is um, uh, a principal investigator of uh, our uh, of, of, of our cluster. Uh, he is also he works um, uh, for the Catalonian um, Institute as a uh, research uh, as a research fellow, and of course he is famous for um, his work on uh, many uh, aspects of uh, social theory and uh, especially the uh, theory of uh, multiple modernities uh, but not only that uh, in a number of uh, fields in sociology uh, uh, professor wagner contributed um, contributed rather greatly and uh, today's talk uh, is indeed uh, has this in kind of provocative, uh, provocative title: the um, climate change as problem uh, as problem solving. And uh, um, well, I'm personally looking very much to the discussion. So, Peter, thank you very much for joining today and for agreeing to give your talk today. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Maxim, um, for the kind introduction. Um, it's uh, I'm very glad to to be back in a sense to continue a conversation which um, we have started uh, earlier on this year. Indeed, uh, some of you, uh, maybe a minority, but some of you will uh, remember um, the discussion earlier this year where I presented um, aspects of the same question of indeed ongoing research of mine, um, but with the more uh, short-term perspective, more looking at uh, 20th century developments. And today uh, I want to, um, in a sense, try out, I really have to say, um, to um, discuss with you uh, a more long-term perspective on climate change, um, or more broadly speaking, on uh, the human use of biophysical resources, in particular fossil fuels, but not only, if one goes further back in history, uh, then the question broadens. Uh, and to understand a bit uh, the um, historical transformations in the relation between human beings and, and non-human nature and the planet overall. So um, that's the, the broad question. Um, and um, well, as I said, this is ongoing research and I'm, uh, I'm trying things out with you. And uh, I, I'm very glad to receive your comments and uh, criticisms. Uh, after this presentation. Now, um, Maxime called this um, provocative. Uh, indeed, I want to start out from this question. There, there is obviously a problem in the current global debate about climate change, which um, I mean, everyone is aware of. Um, there is a, uh, a general uh, recognition of the issue. Uh, the people who deny that climate change is taking place or who deny that climate change is human made um, are less and less. Um, generally, it is recognized um, that it is not only a problem, but maybe the most urgent problem that humanity overall faces. Uh, but at the same time, uh, 
consistent action to do something about the problem doesn't take place. We have seen that most recently uh, at the conference um, uh, in Cairo, uh, where uh, there were intense debate about all aspects of climate change, but um, the final conclusion uh, from the point of view of most observers fell far short of uh, the uh, action that is required to do something about the issue. So uh, that is often discussed as the gap between knowledge and action. Uh, but um, I would argue that there is insufficient understanding for why that is so, because um, then many people discuss um, uh, the issue why, even though there is a consensus in terms of scientific knowledge and broader knowledge overall, uh, and Almost everyone who is interested in the issue accepts that, um, but uh, so that it is seen as a as a communication problem or a transmission problem from those who have the knowledge to those who have to act. But that seems clearly insufficient. So what I'm suggesting is that um, one hasn't really looked at the question uh, why human beings embarked on a trajectory that led to climate change. Um, and uh, my provocative formulation is that we have to have to first see uh, that action that led to climate change was seen as solving problems which human societies had at various points in time and in various places. Now, obviously, we all know that they didn't want to create climate change. They didn't want to create global warming. Um, at least most people, most of the time, didn't intend that. But nevertheless, we have to understand uh, what the if there is any logic behind actions that led to the current situation. So, uh, in, indeed, there is um, uh, there are people who talk about uh, who have investigated climate change from a social science and humanities perspective. They tend to conclude that uh, this is something that uh, that happened inadvertently. Uh, Deepa Shakavati, the South Asian historian. Uh, for instance, uh, talked about humanity stumbling into or sliding into climate change. Uh, but that seems, um, well, maybe not entirely wrong, but insufficient for an understanding because it, um, it closes the question uh, why human beings were doing that and under which circumstances. So what I want to propose to you uh, today is uh, first some reflections upon how one should think about this question and how one should uh, investigate it, uh, more conceptual issues. And in a second step, then uh, very sweepingly look at the long term history of humanity uh, to um, understand better whether there is uh, some kind of um, logic in this development, uh, something that we can understand um, uh, better one, with this change of perspective a logic in the way human beings have increasingly used biophysical resources and from a certain moment onwards fossil fuels um, for solving some of their problems which then led to the current situation of climate change. Um, before doing that in detail let me emphasize this term increase uh, because that is what we have to um, uh, identify uh, that there is some some logic towards increase i'll come back to that in a moment because otherwise if it were um, coincidental uh, if uh, human beings used biophysical resources to solve some kind of short-term or local problems uh, then we wouldn't get to um, the situation we have now uh, where uh, our way of dealing with biophysical resources Endangers, uh, endangers the inhabitability of the planet for human beings. Now, what I want to do in the first step is talk about uh, two concepts, um, uh, namely the concept of scarcity and frontiers. Uh, scarcity uh, is a term which has made, been made most prominent in economics and the economic sciences. Uh, some economists indeed define their discipline as dealing with scarcity, uh, looking at uh, the way resources are allocated, always assuming that resources are in some way scarce so that uh, the question of um, wh whom to give what uh, is the key question of economics and to design institutions like the market most importantly in economic thinking uh, that allocates resources uh, to uh, different human beings or groups of human beings. Um, so uh, because this could be, this would be one way of 
thinking that that is the problem human beings want to solve, uh, namely scarcity. Uh, saying that, though, we immediately should make a, a distinction between what one could call absolute scarcity and relative scarcity. Uh, absolute scarcity uh, is a situation where uh, the lack of resources uh, endangers human life. Uh, this is famines in the history of humankind, where there was not enough food uh, to feed human beings, uh, or also uh, the lack of shelter, uh, the exposure to indeed climate phenomena like heat or cold, uh, where the scarcity of sheltering resources could endanger uh, human life uh, individually or the life of human societies. That we would need to distinguish from uh, some kind of relative scarcity, where um, uh, human beings may not have as many resources as they would like to, or but not in danger of uh, survival, um, uh, not endangering survival, uh, or that um, human beings have resources distributed in an unequal way, where some human beings have sufficient or even abundant resources, uh, but others don't. Uh, that would be a question of uh, normally of some form of hierarchy or asymmetries of power, uh, and importantly also uh, some kind of hierarchy in the way of interpreting problems, because once we think of uh, human beings' relation to biophysical resources as solving problems, it's very important to see who defines what are the problems on which human beings act. Um, and that can be asymmetrically um, um, distributed, that, that power to do so. Now, uh, so that is the, the starting point, that in broadest terms, scarcity may be the problem that uh, may be a way of talking about the problem human beings intend to address when using biophysical resources. Now, uh, how do they do that? There I introduce a second uh, concept, that's uh, the concept of frontier. Uh, namely, once we assume, uh, and you can easily think of historical situations, um, that uh, there is a situation of scarcity uh, in any given human society, uh, then uh, a response to that scarcity uh, could be to, um, uh, to explore frontiers, to cross frontiers, to um, find more resources than are available uh, in the society in the current moment. Uh, I say this, we can easily understand that historically because we know that, uh, say, human societies, uh, when uh, facing adverse climate conditions, uh, say, uh, in the north, uh, in colder periods, then they may migrate um, to move south, uh, where the same problem of scarcity does not exist. Or we know that um, organized human societies, which um, cover some territory, if they face a lack of resources on their territory, uh, maybe because of population growth, uh, then uh, they or their rulers may try to um, uh, expand on the territory, to enlarge the frontiers, the borders of the territory, uh, to gain additional resources, uh, to provide sufficient resources for a growing population. Uh, I've said this in two ways. We can talk about resources as being uh, insufficiently supplied, uh, as scarcity of that kind, or um, resources as being needed uh, in uh, increased number, a question of demand because of historically, mostly because of population growth. Uh, so uh, this would be uh, the extension of frontiers or the expansion beyond existing frontiers. It could be a general concept for understanding how human beings uh, deal with issues of scarcity. Let me make an additional remark about this concept uh, in the light of current debate. Um, we are all aware of um, uh, related terms that have been used in the environmental ecological debate, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, many of you will be aware of the uh, 1972 report of the Club of Rome, which was called Limits to Growth, uh, which is often seen as a key moment in uh, understanding ecological issues, issues of scarcity of resources uh, as a global problem. 
Uh, and interestingly, the Club of Rome used the term limits. Uh, they were indeed, um, the Club of Rome was based basically on calculations, uh, extrapolations of resource use and pointing to the exhaustion of resources at the point uh, in the relatively close future, uh, uh, from speaking from the point of view of the early 1970s. Uh, so limits is in uh, a related term, and in current debate, very often the term boundaries is used, uh, maybe most prominently in the, with the adjective planetary boundaries, uh, that um, due to current research use and the consequences of research use, namely emissions uh, and global warming, uh, planetary boundaries are being reached. Now, the interesting relation between these three terms is uh, they are all, uh, they use a spatial metaphor, uh, uh, the boundaries um, or the circumference of spaces, and they use it, uh, they all seem to say the same, uh, that there is a space which is in some way uh, bounded, delimited. Uh, but uh, the way these terms are used uh, is really highly different. Uh, the um, term limits in the use of the Club of Rome and subsequently uh, basically suggests that there are limits that cannot be transgressed. Um, once the resources are used up, that's the end of the story. Uh, whereas the term boundaries currently is more uh, a warning. Uh, it suggests that human beings can transgress, transgress existing boundaries, but at a high cost. So we can put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, but uh, that will endanger the inhabitability of the planet. In this sense, the term boundaries is different in the way it is used from the term limits. And now, thirdly, frontiers is uh, in current usage, a usage which goes back to the end of the 19th century, an entirely different term. It suggests that, yes, there are current limits, uh, but human beings will solve problems by transgressing these limits. Uh, this goes back to the historiography of the United States uh, to the year actually, 1896, uh, when Frederick Turner published his book about the frontier in American history. And he was suggesting indeed that the whole history of the US should be understood in this light, namely the frontier is the West, uh, where um, uh, the society of the United States indeed uh, developed and changed uh, going westward. And by doing that, it acquired additional resources, natural resources. And at the same time, the society itself changed. Uh, this created a new kind of human being, namely the individualist, adventurist, uh, frontier explorer, uh, which we all know from the standard image of the United States, maybe most prominently from Western movies. Uh, but it is underlying very much the self-understanding of the US. Uh, and this argument and it has been extended. There is a, a later historian, uh, Walter Prescott Webb. Uh, Turner was writing in the 1890s. Um, uh, Webb was writing in the 1930s, who was indeed 1930s and 1950s. There are two significant books um, where he extended this argument and was indeed suggesting in one of those books that um, it is the history of humanity in general since the crossing of the Atlantic by uh, Southern European explorers at the end of the 15th century. That's the argument in one of those books. In one of the other books, uh, Webb was from Texas. Uh, he indeed developed a view of the US society as um, hierarchically divided, um, as having two, uh, three social regions, the North, the South, and the West, where the North was dominating uh, and indeed dominating over the South and over the West um, uh, in this whole understanding of frontier exploration. Uh, the new resources were basically appropriated uh, by the North. Uh, if you take these two elements together, uh, Webb uh, indeed um, uh, developed an approach uh, which would later be uh, generalized and turned into a more critical fashion by Emmanuel Wallerstein uh, when he developed the world systems analysis as an overall view of global history uh, in terms of uh, core societies, uh, which indeed extend frontiers, and by doing so, uh, create uh, peripheries and summative peripheries, which they dominate, uh, most importantly, dominate by extracting resources for them uh, by the use of the core societies. So, uh, 
there we have um, what I've done now is to take a step from the general conceptual observation about scarcity and frontiers towards um, uh, an understanding of human history and how in human history uh, societies have tried to solve problems uh, by uh, transgressing frontiers uh, and have done so uh, at least at times in a uh, asymmetric hierarchical way that there are some human societies or some groups in human societies that define the problems uh, and then impose their solution of the problems uh, to other human beings in their own society or to other societies. Now, uh, so that means in general, um, with a bit of caution, but uh, my angle of looking at human history uh, is this one, that um, human beings uh, transgress existing resource frontiers when and because they are driven by scarcity. They try to solve problems uh, of scarcity. Uh, the um, recent inspiration for such an approach is an economist and economic historian based in the US, Edward Barbier, who some 10 years ago uh, wrote a book which is called Scarcity and Frontiers. And the advantage of his approach is, um, compared to world systems analysis, that he doesn't immediately impose uh, a logic, um, which in uh, world systems analysis is a broadly Marxist materialist logic uh, on human history. But it just poses this question, the question of scarcity as a problem and the way this problem is being resolved uh, by uh, exploring frontiers, transgressing frontiers, uh, leaving at the start, methodologically and conceptually, one might say, the question open as to how human history evolves uh, in this light. So having said that, um, uh, let me move to the second step. Uh, um, in the current understanding, uh, one would, uh, there are indeed, if one looks closely, quite a number of um, scholars who would accept broadly such an approach, but they would immediately combine it with an idea about uh, what the logic of frontier transgression is, a logic of expansion. So they would make a jump from the question of particular problems that need to be solved to a general approach to problem solving, which is entrenched in society, which is uh, are ba either basic human problems or problems of certain human societies as they develop. Let me say this very quickly because um, uh, it is important for the further step. Um, there, We could say that there are basically three such um, uh, main approaches to understanding logics of expansion. The, um, the first one is basically a biological one, and uh, uh, we are all aware of it in some way or other. It goes back to uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, and there the main issue is population growth. Population growth, uh, given uh, that there is a limited globe uh, and limited soil available, uh, assuming that land is the main human resource uh, with which uh, human beings can provide food and shelter. Um, we all know this, this, goes, this is especially a book from the late 18th century, first published 1798, later revised, um, which suggests that there is this limit to human expansion. And he was indeed suggesting that when uh, given human societies uh, reach a frontier, uh, then uh, there will be famines, there will be war, uh, there, will, there will be diseases, uh, so that uh, the population decreases uh, for various reasons. Uh, and this uh, creates um, a new, at least temporary equilibrium. Uh, and there is no other way. Well, he was actually toying with some ways, but he was basically saying this is the main problem. And uh, human societies have difficulties uh, addressing this issue as a general issue so that they will always face um, this boundary. In, indeed, economists even today talk about Malthusian stagnation uh, when uh, a certain way of organizing an economy has reached such a limit which cannot easy, be, easily be tra transgressed. Especially economic historians look at different situations way beyond Malthus uh, in such a light. Um, now, we know Malthus writing at the end of the uh, 18th century uh, he broadly was aware that in earlier periods of human histories, societies have solved these problems by expansion, by territorial expansion. 
but at his time of writings, um, he, in, a, in a famous passage of uh, one version of this book, he suggests that uh, all land is already possessed, uh, so that uh, further expansion is not possible. It's not possible land-wise uh, because there is no empty space which human societies can uh, uh, can occupy, can expand on. Now, uh, we, we can come back to everything in discussion. Uh, let me jump immediately uh, to um, two other approaches, which basically emerged at the same time, namely the late, late 18th, early 19th century. And uh, in contrast to the biological explanation, which Malthus gives, they are social explanations. Um, we could call one social political and the other one political economic. The social political explanation is that um, uh, is the uh, the human desire for freedom, uh, and uh, this is set in the late 18th, early 19th century in the light of Enlightenment debates, and then the political revolutions like the French Revolution, but also the American Declaration of Independence and the Haitian Revolution, uh, and that uh, liberating human beings from uh, oppression of one way or the other also uh, liberates human beings uh, uh, towards um, uh, dealing autonomously, freely with problems of scarcity. Uh, again, I may refer to Deepa Shakabati again, who in his critical work on climate change says at one point, uh, the mention of human freedoms is built on an ever increasing uh, foundation of fossil fuels, so that um, this view one situates um, the problem. Uh, what, what situates the problem is uh, the desire of freedom and action based on free choice. Uh, uh, one relates that in terms of consequences to later climate change. Again, I'll uh, I'll be short about this and move to the polit That's the social political explanation. Uh, and the political economic explanation is related to capitalism, there the assumption is that it is, it's again a theory that dates to um, the early 19th century, uh, but and the assumption is quite um, developed in parallel to the argument about freedom, uh, but in, in a critical way, suggesting that uh, it is not that human societies overall become free, uh, but they become class divided at the same time. Uh, so this approach indeed thematizes asymmetries of power and of problem definition in my terms, and is suggesting that the um, increasing use of natural resources and in particular fossil fuels from then on uh, is related to um, this asymmetry and problem definition uh, that indeed uh, profit, profit seeking capitalists uh, exploit resources in a um, in a more accelerated way, uh, indeed, for uh, uh, for the purpose of making profits. Now, so these are three ways of uh, assuming that, in my term terminology, now human problem solving uh, indeed can step out of the contingency of history. Uh, out of the multitude of different local situations of problems and their solutions and create a logic that uh, leads to the, uh, the expansion of use of resources, so in, as one would now say, an acceleration of resource use. Now, um, if we now look at these three theories um, in the light of what we know about resource use, and in particular re use of fossil fuels, uh, then we see uh, certain problems that we can transform into questions for the research. Well, first of all, looking at Malthus, um, uh, writing at the end of the 18th century, uh, he may have observed relatively well earlier history, uh, but uh, some people would argue that he writes at exactly the time at which human beings overcome Malthusian constraints, namely due to the Industrial Revolution, that they discover ways of using uh, inanimate sources of energy uh, to solve their problems of scarcity, uh, and that this uh, sets human society on a new trajectory. 
uh, what's the argument about industrial society, industrial revolution and the consequences, which um, in a sense fits quite well with uh, some of the data we have about resource use uh, afterwards. Uh, so that would mean that um, we can, to some extent, dis discard or at least uh, delimit the importance of Malthus' theory by saying that exactly at the moment when he was writing, a historical transformation occurred that changed the kind of problem human societies were facing. Which leads us to the other two theories, which we could say emerge at exactly that time, but in the light of this historical transformation. Uh, so uh, the theorists of freedom and the theorists or freedom and modernity and the theorists of capitalism, they are based on the insight that the problem uh, of scarcity is being solved by other means from exactly that moment onwards. Um, so they have an advantage over Malthus, even though, let me just say that as a parenthesis, we cannot discard Malthus uh, overall. Now, looking at these two theories, theories of modernity and capitalism, we see uh, there are several problems with them. Uh, the one is uh, that they are actually quite um, ambivalent about, and to some extent divided, about whether one should indeed look at the period around 1800 as the major uh, transformation in resource use, or rather at the period around 1500, which I mentioned before briefly, the crossing of the Atlantic, uh, and which, for instance, uh, world systems analysis, analysis sees at the beginning of uh, the capitalist world economy. So that's a question, do we look at 1500 or 1800 for a change in the logic of human resource use? The second problem with these theories is that they basically assume that once modernity or capitalism are in place, a freedom-based or a profit-based new human order, uh, then this logic is also in place and it's basically unchanged. So they are not very capable of looking at changes afterwards in the more recent past. And that, if we look at patterns of resource use, uh, is problematic because we see, I'll come to that in a moment, that uh, human use of natural resources actually changes considerably since 1800. And um, the uh, third question and the third um, distinction between the two approaches is, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, the question uh, to, to look at uh, who defines problems and who has the power to uh, decide about certain ways of solving problems and others. We have seen that theories, critical theories of capitalism uh, focus more on that issue than theories of modernity, but we may have doubts whether they do so adequately. With this, I um, am close to stopping the conceptual observations that you've seen I have already moved to human history. And in most of the remainder of the presentation, I want to look at certain moments of human history uh, in this light. Um, of course, this can only be very short. And in many cases, you may have more to say about how one should look at these uh, transformations. Before making that step, let me just say what um, the requirements for um, this look at human history as problem solving uh, is, uh, and the, the relation between problem solving and the creation of a logic of uh, expansion of resource use. Uh, we could say that um, we can make a first distinction uh, between uh, a way of problem solving, solving the problem of scarcity, which human beings embark on knowing about the consequences of this change and or not knowing about it. Uh, because we all know uh, we can not reasonably assume that at 1500 or 1800 human beings could foresee climate change as a consequence of their action. So that is a question uh, in with what kind of knowledge do human beings solve problems by increasing the use of natural resources. Now if they don't know about it, uh, then we talk about unintended consequences in some way or other, which is a, a key concept in much of uh, the history of sociology. Uh, and unintended consequences can emerge in two ways. They can emerge uh, as the aggregation of numerous individual actions. 
uh, that we can just think of uh, to give a, 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 a flawed example uh, that if everyone uses fossil fuel resources to heat their homes, uh, then it can just be the aggregate, the sum of all these actions that increases, um, that leads to global warming. This is obviously not, not true as such, but uh, just to give the example as a simple aggregate, so to say, a, a quantitative sum of different actions. Or alternatively, it can be a concatenation of actions um, where not a, again, not a single action creates uh, the consequences, uh, but also not the aggregate, uh, but uh, the follow up on one action and the chains of interactions that create, in this case, a new institutional uh, situation and can create a logic. Now, uh, if something is done with knowledge of consequences, and that is the more recent situation, then um, arguably there must be some assumption by those who pursue these actions that um, the significance of solving a problem is greater than the significance of the consequences that are possibly generated. Uh, I'll come back to that. That is more the 20th century situation where we have um, more extended knowledge of the consequences of our research resource use. So, uh, Maxim, you stop me if I talk for too long, but I, I come now to the uh, to the second main part, so to say, but which will be a bit shorter, I think. No problem. Well, I could go at any length about yeah, it. Go ahead. <laughs> um, this is the historical part. Uh, and there I have already given some hints. Um, let me say very briefly, if we look at human societies before 1500, uh, so before the crossing of the Atlantic, um, then we see that uh, there are lots of changes. There is a, quite a variety of different situations, but the uh, uh, human use of natural resources it does not increase significantly, at least in the light of later developments. It does not increase significantly because, uh, again, in the light of what happens later, uh, even though there is population growth, the, uh, the growth is rather limited. Uh, it doesn't, globally speaking, it doesn't reach limits or boundaries. Uh, and secondly, and importantly, also the per capita use of resources basically doesn't increase. With all the changes and the variety of situations, um, I mean, from uh, hunter and gatherer societies uh, to um, settled agricultural societies, uh, from uh, rather small scale societies with low degrees of hierarchy uh, to the building of, emp uh, of empires with a strong stratification uh, among uh, a ruling class, a ruling elite and a larger population, the uh, average per capita use uh, doesn't increase significantly. We also see that it's important in contrast to standard views of human history that uh, one cannot really see uh, an evolutionary step in the change uh, from uh, hunter-gatherer or nomadic societies to settled agricultural societies. This has often been assumed, uh, but uh, the closer look and with the knowledge we have now, uh, the move to agriculture often was a move to, um, uh, in the light of problems, but to an economy of deprivation. Uh, early agricultural societies were not normally richer, uh, more affluent than hunter-gatherer or nomadic societies, which is important for the history of Central Asia overall. Um, and um, similarly, uh, if we look at uh, empires, uh, then we also see that they do expand. Um, they try to expand when they face uh, scarcity problems, um, but um, uh, this also doesn't increase, uh, it increases research, resource use uh, in relation to the territorial expansion, but it doesn't increase global resource use uh, and not per capita resource use. So we don't really, there are some people, there are some scholars who assume that the agricultural revolution is the beginning uh, of the trajectory which leads to climate change today. Uh, but uh, this um, overall from uh, the knowledge I've been able to gather, uh, this is overall not very plausible. Which leads us to the period around 1500. Um, 
which is in theories of capitalism, of global capitalism, is a key moment. And indeed, there are quite a number of ecologically minded scholars nowadays, critical ecologically minded scholars, who indeed look at this moment as um, the beginning of the problem that we now face, and they relate it directly to um, uh, the emergence of capitalism, merchant capitalism. So this is then related to um, uh, the uh, to the European expansion, to the crossing of the Atlantic. And um, the important step here is that what happens here, uh, and to the not for the first time, but uh, in a different degree, a different scale than any time earlier, is that the expansion across space uh, does not happen on territory, but across the seas. Uh, so it is a move from uh, territorial from crossing uh, it's a move across horizontal frontiers as um, economic historians now call that but it is a change from a move across territorial horizontal frontiers towards maritime horizontal frontiers uh, there is a big debate about this question uh, some of you again to make an asian reference may be aware it, it keeps being a debate uh, in relation to the so-called rise of europe uh, why, given the um, uh, social organization and capacities of Chinese society, the Chinese empire at that moment, uh, why this change occurred, which in the long term should lead to the rise of Europe. And one looks then in particular at the 15th century uh, maritime capacities of China uh, with explorations that went as far as Southern Africa, uh, to current Mozambique, for instance, uh, Forgive my pronunciation. Zheng He was the basic, was the explorer, sort of the uh, equivalent, one might say, to Columbus in the West and earlier. Uh, but this was abandoned, um, and Western historians always ask the question about why that was abandoned, given that this would uh, debilitate China in a long-term perspective. But I think the look at problem-solving interests uh, provides a relatively easy answer to that question. And I'm not an expert of Chinese history, but one can clearly see that China was rather successful with uh, uh, horizontal territorial expansion and its consolidation. And indeed, in this period, in the 15th century, it was mostly occupied with territorial consolidation, with um, uh, defense against uh, northern adversaries, with um, the Chinese wall, with the canal building on the territory. Uh, so their issues, uh, the, the problems they were facing and the way they defined them uh, didn't suggest that maritime expansion would be a solution to them. Uh, rather, there was a, a different kind of urgency with consolidating territorial expansion, which also means that, uh, and I want to underline, this is this is basically the shift of perspective that we should look at um, the moment in time and the way uh, living actors at that moment uh, defined the situations and the problems they were facing. Now, Europe at that moment uh, was um, not at all uh, a significant world region in terms of power and affluence uh, at around 1500. And one could rather see that um, the maritime expansion um, uh, by Portuguese and uh, Spanish explorers um, with the support of Italians uh, was uh, uh, undertaken with certain capacities like increase of shipbuilding and knowledge about winds, um, but otherwise out of a, a kind of crisis situation, which is related to the rise of the Ottoman Empire and uh, difficulties um, uh, of uh, eastward trade, uh, and also with um, um, uh, the uh, uh, Mongolian uh, empires in uh, territorial Asia. So they were facing problems um, uh, of that kind, which rather pressed them to explore other ways. And the, um, uh, the maritime expansion it should be seen in that light, not as consciously embarking on some superior trajectory. So this is a look at that situation from both the Chinese and the Iberian point of view, uh, the definition of problems at that moment. Now, in terms of consequences, um, there is one argument that um, uh, this was really the beginning of a massive resource transfer uh, from 
the Americas and Africa towards Europe. And that this is the main argument uh, for the rise of Europe, the main cause of the rise of Europe. Uh, and um, uh, at the same time, the embarking on a more resource intensive uh, trajectory of humanity overall. Uh, this is done by uh, these critical world systems analysts um, now with this more ecological resource oriented perspective, and it has some truth to it, uh, but um, it seems insufficient overall to understand this transformation in human history. Uh, one reason for thinking that it's insufficient is that uh, still we cannot observe a significant increase in um, per capita use of biophysical resources between 1500 and 1800. There is some increase. Um, there is an intensification uh, uh, of production and consumption, uh, in particular in Europe, which is uh, sometimes related to what is called the industrious revolution, an intensification of work and production. Uh, but um, the industrious revolution it does not significantly uh, increase resource exploitation. That's the one argument against this, or at least relativizing uh, uh, the notion that uh, the Atlantic expansion uh, and the, the emergence of capitalism is the major change. The other argument is that um, actually the resource transfer uh, is not in, in quantitative terms is not very significant. Actually, what Western Europe gains in terms of resources, it does gain, uh, but um, is, is not significant compared to the uh, persistent uh, local orientation, small scale orientation of even European economies. So one has to be careful about this argument. Um, the uh, combination of uh, assuming a, uh, the, the, the power of a, an emerging capitalist class that drives towards expansion and that that leads to increasing and asymmetric resource use is not entirely wrong, uh, but it is flawed uh, in these two senses. And it's also flawed uh, in the third sense, namely that it's difficult to assume that, uh, say, in the 15th century, that there is some capitalist class in Europe that can assert its interests to such a way that it becomes the main definer of problems and pushes towards uh, maritime expansion. Uh, at a closer look, this is just simply not the case. There's insufficient evidence for that. Uh, there are all the arguments that can be constructed uh, towards the um, uh, uh, economic changes uh, in terms of double bookkeeping and new forms of accounting um, and the relation between uh, Italy-based knowledge in that regard and the uh, Iberian interest in this. But um, it doesn't, uh, it's not sufficient to develop that uh, interpretation and in particular it does not it also does not pay um, any attention to the fact that um, the Portuguese and Spanish uh, expansion is of a quite different kind than the Dutch and English expansion a century or more later which more plausibly can be related to a new form of uh, economic ecological regime namely the extension of long distance trade of commodities which was not really the key uh, concern of the Portuguese and the Spaniards, who were more dealing in precious metals. Um, so I should be short about that. Uh, I want to suggest here basically that what happens is something else, namely that uh, I want to give great significance to um, uh, the transatlantic opening, uh, and including the fact that from that point in time onwards, or at least from the 17th century, uh, African labor was working on American soil for the benefit uh, of European societies. And that that indeed is important in understanding that the Malthusian constraint could be overcome, that in that sense, European labor could be freed from food production uh, because um, sugar 
uh, coffee uh, food, uh, production of food and shelter, uh, uh, sugar, coffee, um, uh, cotton uh, would be imported from the Americas produced by African labor. Uh, that is true. But what we need here is um, an overall change of perspective, which is related to this, namely a new way of thinking about society, uh, a new self-understanding. And that um, uh, that requires us to read uh, political and economic theories uh, of the 17th and 18th centuries uh, in the light of this, um, this changing political economic organization. Uh, some of you will be aware that um, uh, this was Albert Hirschman who looked at these theories as providing arguments for capitalism before its triumph. That's his formulation. Well, basically the, the argument, now purely it's an intellectual argument, but in the background of uh, these changes is that the increase in trade, the building of a commercial society would lead to domestic peace, first of all, because trade is based on interest, not on passions. It's passions that lead to violence and warfare. Uh, if you create societies that are more built on trade, they will be more pacific. They will lead less wars. That's the first argument. And that then gets connected by people like Adam Smith to the argument that once you intensify trade, once you build societies on a division of labor, uh, then this increasing specialization will also increase wealth. So uh, peace and affluence uh, were the promises of this new kind of society. And that's suggested against the background of the maritime expansion, certainly, but it suggested a changing institutional organization of European societies uh, to favor commerce uh, over other ways of human beings relating to each other. There is a philosopher historian in France currently, Pierre Chabonnier, who has written a book on affluence and freedom, uh, called Affluence and Freedom, who's suggesting that this is the liberal pact, that um, there is the um, uh, building societies uh, on commerce, which means the free in interaction of economic agents, that's the part of freedom, will enhance affluence and enhance wealth. Um, so that is, there is the, the promise is that once you build free societies, they will also be rich societies. Um, now, what is important to say here is that if you look at uh, this political economic thinking until the end of the 18th century, and that includes importantly Smith, and Malthus is part of the political, econ political economy debate of that time, they do not think of increasing the use of resources. They um, uh, increase the division of labor, uh, the political economists, they increase specialization. And so this is much more related to um, the industrial revolution, the increasing intensity of work itself, of labor. After all, we have to keep in mind that they worked with the labor theory of value, as would Marx later on. So labor was the main uh, ingredient for increasing wealth, not resources. Um, and this is uh, reflected in what we know about resource use, especially fossil fuel uh, use, which does not increase significantly until 1800. So the, uh, it's um, problematic to look at the sources for our current resource intensive trajectory in the period between 1500 and 1800. What really changes uh, is around 1800, and now I really have to speed up because I've almost been talking for an hour. Uh, so let me do this more quickly. Indeed, some of you uh, will have heard this part of the argument from me uh, half a year ago uh, in May in another presentation. So uh, around 1800, what we see, if we have seen earlier a shift from uh, territorial frontier exploration uh, towards maritime frontier exploration, we now have a shift towards vertical frontiers, uh, deep coal mining, basically. And that is the, the shift that first occurs um, in Britain. Uh, Kenneth Pomeranz has developed a detailed argument about why that happens there uh, in connection of resource availability near to urban settings uh, and in connection to the resource transfer I mentioned before across the Atlantic in comparison to regions of China, which had basically similar um, wealth and institutional constellations as Western Europe at that moment. That is the reason for the great divergence uh, between Europe and other regions of the world. 
according to Pomeranz, and virtual frontier exploration, coal mining, is uh, a key the key part of that. So there we get to much closer to the core of the issues, uh, to the use of fossil fuels as vertical frontier exploration. Uh, now, what we uh, what we see then, uh, though, is um, that. Uh, even though this creates a new trajectory, uh, it does not um, uh, enhance fossil fuel use very significantly, again, in the light of later developments. What we have across the 19th century is increasing use of coal, uh, but still uh, societies that um, um, are highly unequal, indeed become more unequal in the 19th century in Europe, uh, and um, uh, where the, the promise of affluence um, is indeed not conveyed to the larger society. But what we have at the same time, uh, there are two other elements which are important. The first is that uh, this vertical frontier is explored in one world region, Western Europe only, uh, and uh, it is based on the resource transfer from other parts of the world at the same time, it's the first element. The second element is that because of this political and intellectual change in the 18th century, uh, the idea of freedom, including collective freedom and democracy, was uh, set into the world. So there was an unfulfilled promise, an unfulfilled aspiration of setting societies onto a new institutional track uh, with greater degrees of equality. Uh, now, what happens in the 19th century it, the, is that this uh, egalitarian democratic imaginary becomes a powerful force in society exactly because it was not realized. Every claim, even claim about um, uh, worsening working and living conditions under emerging capitalism, it was related to uh, democracy as the means to change that situation. You find that even, even in Marx, um, where um, uh, the expectation, uh, where actually the denial of democracy by the ruling classes is the key uh, to the possibility, exploitative possibilities of capitalism. And once that would change, then everything would change. But it, by and large, it doesn't happen during the 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, uh, suffrage is increased, but it doesn't become universal, not even universal male suffrage. It becomes, it uh, remains um, uh, census related. So the main change then we see at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, when um, with the rising workers movement and claims of this kind uh, and the first world war, which made the Western elites dependent on the majority of the population, uh, militarily in the war and at home at the home front, um, including women, um, importantly women uh, working at the home front, uh, making the elites dependent on the majority of the population uh, uh, in, in Western societies. And we then have uh, the first half of the 20th century in which on the one hand this is recognized, we have um, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, uh, we have the rising workers movement in, in Europe, uh, we have the introduction of universal male suffrage in some societies, male and female suffrage in some societies. And then we have uh, basically the collapse of the new constellation uh, due to um, uh, uh, rising polarization in these societies, the rise of totalitarianism. And we get to the uh, end of the Second World War, the moment at which elites, um, uh, Western elites, uh, basically conclude that uh, the scallops and the wars are importantly related to um, the inability to solve the social question. Uh, this leads to polarization uh, and the, their intention is to avoid that for the future. Now they have not avoided that earlier on uh, because they didn't know how to do that without relinquishing their privileges. Uh, that is why the elites, bourgeois and capitalists, but also old aristocratic elites, uh, were oppressing the workers and the feminist movement, um, because giving in would mean relinquishing the privileges. At the end of the 20th century, they found a way of um, uh, finding a solution without relinquishing privileges, and that was creating effluence through fossil fuels. 
which now means crude oil and gas. Um, so uh, the main reason uh, for the full embarking on a fossil fuel trajectory uh, is this change after the Second World War, when um, first within Western societies, the um, uh, fossil fuels were used to solve problems of political consol consolidation by uh, creating welfare states and increasing material effluence throughout societies uh, with a view to avoiding um, uh, political polarization and deconsolidation. This worked for 30 years um, in the West, uh, and it was rather consciously divided uh, at the end of the Second World War, uh, denied to other world regions. Uh, but at the end, uh, in the 1970s, this entered into crisis in the West. Um, and uh, this is the moment of the, the insight into global ecological problems with the limits to growth argument. And Western societies start to relocate industries um, and that leads to um, uh, the rise of the East, one can say, the great acceleration in resource use uh, in Eastern Asia, in China, and somewhat later in India, which now creates the current, um, which globalizes the resource intensive trajectory, which was only Western from the beginning, and creates the current situation. So um, I've said that with a view to saying that Indeed, there was, one could say, a political problem that was at the center of concerns at the end of Second World of the Second World War, which leads to the full embarking on the fossil fuel trajectory uh, and which creates the current situation. I was very quick now with the historical sketch, but I think I stop here and uh, look forward to your comments and uh, critical questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. We are experiencing here in uh, campus, uh, you know, electricity is down. So oh, uh, that's why Sehar, uh, you know, had to leave. And um, yeah, so well, I hope, uh, you know, at least my batteries will be enough, you know, for uh, moderating the, um, you know, another. The, we see our dependence the on remains of the resources. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The remainder of the well, we are striving for the net zero, you know, emission. So this is probably you know, one of the consequences. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so, colleagues, uh, let us um, ask uh, the questions and or, or comments, and um, those who are panelists can raise their hands. Um, others can write. Um, their uh, questions in the in the chat. So I will start with the with the chat. Um, uh, Mariam Giovanni asks um, the following question: Beyond scarcity and frontiers, what are your thoughts regarding how ideologies or group of people encouraged or discouraged them from using certain resources, or how the they um, problem solved? So this is basically about ideologies, mm, yes. which I guess you uh, you already talked about, but maybe you can. Yeah, no, thank you very much for the question, which um, allows me to say something more clearly, maybe than I have said it until now. Um, what I really try to do, let me say it first as, a, as, as an approach, um, we, these main theories of modernity and capitalism, they're basically, one could say, institutional theories, um, that there is a capitalist market organization, that there is a, a liberal political democratic uh, institutionalization. And while this is important, it leaves out of sight uh, on, on the two sides, so to say, uh, the, what for understanding climate change are the more important aspects. There is on the one side, the resource use, I've talked much about that, but on the other side, and I've said maybe too little about that, is what I call the societal self-understanding. And you can call that ideology, you can call that um, the ideational basis of society. And I think this combination is important. Uh, I mean, going back to um, uh, the pre-1800 period, I think it is entirely crucial to understand that European societies developed this idea of uh, liberal commercial society as a new way of organizing the world. Uh, and um, 
uh, that this then in a later step encouraged research, research intensified resource use. Uh, I think if, if just the uh, counterfactually, the um, transatlantic expansion had happened uh, without a rethinking of how of the basis of society in Europe, uh, then maybe this later step of the deep coal mining might well not have occurred. But it's counterfactual and speculative, of course. But I want to underline indeed that it is um, uh, the way in which different self-understandings uh, encourage or allow different ways of resource use, which is entirely central to my way of reasoning. And then jumping back to um, the second half of the 20th century, I think this was there essential as well, that um, the solving of the social question, the creation of the welfare state was a new way of thinking about society. Uh, and this was based on oil and gas. Uh, so this connection is often not seen when one looks only at political and economic institutions as much of sociology and political science does, and it overlooks these other two sides, the relation between, let's call it ideologies on the one side and resources on the other. So thank you very much for your question to allow me to say more on that. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mahmoud Shaw. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's really wonderful lecture. Thank you, Peter. I, I think the, this week also we had a cl class on the topic of the science and society, which is relating to some extent some questions which you raised relating to this uh, topic. We had a reading from the Russell, from the snow about two cultures. We had a small article on monas uh, from Monasterisk on the age of human. But I have a comment just on the question of the this uh, your title, climate change and the problems problem solving, and to some extent is related to the word of the crisis in Chinese and also in the in the Greek. It means uh, they talk when, when they talk about the crisis, they talk about the danger and opportunity. And when you're looking on the in terms of the human age and in the process which you have in detail, I think it's really wonderful chapter of your book you writing about this kind of the crisis. I think it's, you, you, sometimes people, okay, they talk about the danger and then about the opportunity as a crisis, but you, it seems that you are putting the opportunity, then the danger. It, it was what in the process, for instance, when you're looking at the logic of the logic of the understanding of the crisis in the human history, you also, also mentioned about this uh, a persistent discrepancy about the availability knowledge and also a lack of action. And when you're looking at the history of the mankind, I think it's really maybe in the past it was mainly lack of the knowledge and more, more action, especially in the, in the last centuries. But maybe I think it is to some extent it looks like this, that people had more knowledge, but not enough, not enough. No, they, they had more action in, in but lack of knowledge. I think there's some kind of the, what uh, Russell is criticizing this uh, when he talks about the, this famous thing of the Karl Marx about the, in, in his uh, thesis on the Fairback about the use of the science and science using the science in order to understand the world, also using the science to change the world. That uh, up to now the philosophers interpreted the world interpreted the world in a different way, but the the question is to alter it, not to interpret it. And really, it's really the love to the power. Also, okay, it's more action, not uh, enough. I think even in in, the, in this time of the 19th and 20th century, people had a lot. I think available knowledge was enough. I think knowledge was available and also action. I think there's something which is very, very concerning in this uh, logic of the crisis, availability, availability of knowledge or a danger and opportunity, opportunity and danger, what's happening with the mankind, which is brought to this, we're now facing maybe the problems in today's world. And uh, also concerning the scarcity, I think there's really something which is a, when we talk about the scarcity, it's really a very important conception to understand what is happening for, concerning the, and also, can, and in this way, people also develop, okay, 
It brought to the scientific revolution and industrial revolution, production of the wealth and many other things and the food and um, shelter and many other stuff. But also you can see that uh, something, when you talk about the this wonderful conception, when you talk about the limits and boundaries and the frontiers, I think it is really something frontier is related to the corruption itself. And the corruption is very, was also something uh, very key conception in this process, maybe with, uh, together with the scarcity, the corruption, which is when I talk about the frontiers, it is something in human nature is about the frontiers, uh, about the corruption itself. Sometimes uh, within the civilization, over the, the human nature, uh, individuals, I think there's something which is happening, something which is within the, what is now facing the problem. And uh, yeah, I, I think it is a wonderful, the climate change the problem solving, but we now still, do we have a available knowledge or we are lack of knowledge, the lack of the action, what, what, what's going on in today's world, which is uh, yeah. confusing me for instance. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. So, uh... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much, uh, so very, very rich um, uh, reflections. Um, yes, you're entirely right. Um, I mean, maybe let me first say about um, empirically, so to say, about the lack of knowledge. Um, the uh, I think it is um, uh, clear that uh, from the end of the 19th century, uh, there was um, uh, increasing and rapidly increasing knowledge uh, that uh, industrialization uh, changes um, uh, changes the earth, so to say. Uh, I mean, we know that the first uh, scholarly argument about global warming due to um, uh, emissions is from the 1890s. But of course, it was not very solid because the data were not there. One couldn't really establish the connection very well. <clears throat> so this was not about climate change, but um, uh, we, we had this, it was more an experiential, even partly visual uh, expression of crisis, namely that people could see how industry and cities transformed the relation to human nature. And in European, also in the, in U, in the US, uh, nature movements emerge, nature protection. So uh, this danger was seen then. But one can probably also conclude that at that point in time, um, the opportunities were seen as far greater than the dangers. Uh, so uh, just by creating some natural parks or so, one could deal with the issue. Now about climate change um, itself, I, I think their uh, overall the um, uh, the 1960s and 1970s uh, are the period where our knowledge really changes. Uh, first, uh, with regard to um, uh, the limits of resources and the transformation of the earth in general in the 1960s and 1970s, but then already in the 1970s with regard to climate change. So uh, from then on, uh, so to say, looking a bit abstractly, uh, but no one, let's say, at least in the decision-making elites, uh, could claim not to know about it. Uh, basically, it was known. So that leads to, which I think is your, uh, more, your more conceptual and philosophical question, to, so to say, what do we do with the knowledge? Uh, how do we um, uh, relate the knowledge to, um, to, our, to the crisis and the problems we face? And there, I think, we have, um, interestingly, not advanced very much, I think, uh, because um, we have, at least since the 19th century, maybe earlier, this divide that you were talking about, um, namely, uh, between seeing dangers or seeing opportunities. Um, and um, uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, I think the main divide is that on the one hand, one can be optimistic about uh, human beings as knowing subjects, uh, always being able to find a solution to the problems they create. That is what Marx said in the uh, preface to the critique of political economy. Uh, humanity only uh, poses itself problems that it can also solve. Uh, so he was a knowledge optimist, so to say. Um, 
Whereas on the other hand, you have um, uh, this attitude to knowledge which emphasizes limits um, and always says, well, whatever kind of new knowledge we get, it will show us what we should not do. Um, and uh, I think these are, to some extent, these are really different attitudes. You could say existential philosophical attitudes um, to uh, the human condition, broadly speaking. Now, the problem is that um, if, if you look at later debates, we haven't really advanced very much with this opposition and what to do with it. Uh, I mean, in the, at the end of the Second World War, there was a report to the US president, which was called Science, the Endless Frontier, which was basically suggesting that it was using the frontier topic from US history uh, and saying that, uh, of course, here in the first half of the 20th century, we have faced enormous problems, um, and uh, but we have developed science to solve these problems militarily. That was a reference to the um, uh, nuclear bomb. Uh, and the argument there was, now that we have done that, uh, we should use science to solve our social problems. And it was um, it was a challenge, um, but it was basically seen as an opportunity that now we should use this capacity we have acquired in the Manhattan Project um, to solve problems of education, health, poverty in US society. And in that sense, it was very optimistic, no? the knowledge, and it's endless. So that's important, the term endless frontier. We can always go further. Uh, whatever problems we face, new knowledge will solve them. And currently, um, I think that, and that is very problematic, uh, given that climate change has uh, gone to the stage where it is now. There are, um, mostly within, econ within economics, but not only, also in political debate, there is just this assumption that uh, innovation is the main clue to solve uh, the climate problem. Uh, there is a French economist, Philippe Aguillon, uh, who has uh, worked on uh, Schumpeterian economics, so saying capitalism is about creative destruction, and uh, that uh, we have created, he he's very ecological, he said we have obviously created this problem, uh, but now we can destroy this industrial economy and create something new, and uh, if we only set our minds to that, um, capitalist market society can solve this issue which it has created itself. And um, so that is again, it's the same kind of uh, basically thinking in terms of opportunities based on new knowledge. Uh, whereas um, I think, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, what you refer to as corruption is maybe related to that, you know, that we, uh, I, I tend to call this hubris uh, with another ancient term, uh, that um, uh, exactly this belief that uh, the human capacity, the human ingenuity uh, will be able to deal with everything because we are in principle capable of controlling and mastering everything. And um, uh, that, uh, we, we have this divide. I think in part um, the reason why um, the climate change debate does not really lead to the broad social political transformation, which I think we need, really setting our societies on a different basis, is related to this divide because significant parts of our elites, knowledge, economic and political elites, think we can just solve the problems by another turn of the screw, so to say, a, a new generation of knowledge, which will create a new economy. Uh, but I think this is hubristic. Um, I think it will not work. It will, uh, well, it will come too late. Uh, it will not work in the sense that it will create new problems, which we now do not foresee. Uh, and it postpones issues um, into the future, uh, which leaves new and greater problems for new generations. Uh, but so this divide is um, is a main problem. And uh, thank you for underlining that and allowing me to say more about that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Suhil? Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think there's a lot of ground covered in your uh, talk, and it's for me difficult to come back to some of the amazing points. But, you know, obviously that um, I think you, you pointed out in your presentation um, about the issue of scientific dogmas and, um, and, um, and some sort of uh, unfounded beliefs in uh, scientific 
uh, revolutions and solutions uh, to the problems that humanity faces. And also some people believe that uh, climate change is an entirely accidental issue. And, uh, and I think also you talked about it. And, and uh, in the past, I've read even a paper about that um, the issue can be traced back to the dawn of Christianity and uh, the hierarchical religious uh, ideology that man is just at the top of the hierarchy and has the power or, or man has been made in God's image. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and inheriting the powers of creation and creativity, which found expression in scientific uh, revolutions in 1500, 1600, uh, and, and then onwards. Um, also, your, your points about the scarcity, to me, a scarcity is rather self-imposed because a scarcity is always relative, and it is relative to certain needs, and those needs are always defined by some social classes or ideologies or serving the purpose of um, a certain class of people. And, and the question is that, whether the scarcities we are facing are natural consequences of human evolution or are just, just the byproducts of the capitalist uh, scientific uh, society that uh, we have created. So I wonder that, so, you know, taking into account all these different perspectives and, uh, and uh, and approaches. Uh, what are your thoughts about the new approaches? For example, systems thinking, deep ecology, coming back to some Eastern philosophical approaches. So, what do you? So, what are your thoughts about the future of climate change uh, by looking at these new emerging uh, fields of studies and also scientific approaches? And particularly, systems thinking seems to be very kind of it's sort of gaining momentum mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, more and more uh, scientists and uh, scientific institutions are trying to adopt it so what are your thoughts on these new approaches thank you very much Sahe. um uh, overall uh, i mean i do think that um, this also um, uh, brings us back to um, i think the first question mariam's question about uh, ideology uh, i think that um in, in different societal self-understanding is certainly required uh, so the my first response is uh, yes this is important but let me add two more uh, concrete elements to it the first thing is about your uh, remarks about christianity scientific revolution um the i mean th there is certainly some truth to that but um i tend to think that um uh, the uh, the long tracing of um, in a sense lines of development which build upon each other um, it doesn't entirely convince me I think we need to think more in terms of uh, transformations over this uh, long durée over the long lasting developments uh, for instance I don't think there is a straight line from Christianity to the scientific revolution uh, because after all uh scientific thinking in europe was basically built on arab foundations um so the there is obviously the the christian uh, command to subject nature but how what kind of role that plays in later developments uh, i think is much more doubtful uh, because the the lines of continuity cannot really be clearly traced, or at least I have not been convinced of the attempts of tracing them. Um, the, your argument about um, the social definition of scarcity is, is highly important. The, I mean, I've, I've said it at the beginning, but I've not fully developed it in the in the uh, further presentation. So I'm, I'm glad you underlined that now, uh, because that, that is clearly uh, highly important. Uh, all the major um, transformations uh, that I try to, to point to, they are uh, defined uh, in certain regions of the world or by certain types of people also. Um, so we don't have a global communication about this on equal terms. I mean, we haven't had it at any time and we don't have it now. Uh, maybe actually we are now a bit closer than we were at earlier times, but um, we clearly don't have it. Now the problem definition is very asymmetric and very hierarchical. So part of this re these reflections, they should serve also to, to underline this, that we have to look at 
who is trying to define problems and how. Now coming to your, the core of your question, uh, I think the, the elements you mentioned, um, uh, systems thinking, deep ecology, Eastern thinking, they are all, uh, I, I see them as components of um, a, a broader rethinking that is going on. And I would really, uh, this is not my main line of investigation, but if I had to do this, if I were to do this, maybe at a later point, I would, um, in, in global terms, I would go back to the 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, as a um, uh, transformative moment, where, which is not least um i think a major well it's a it's a global transformation it's maybe the beginning of uh, a truly intellectual globalization where voices from other world regions become more prominent after at least a century and a half of european domination of debate um but, but now I'm speaking loosely because I haven't investigated that fully. But I think we can see from then, from the 1960s and 70s, the elements you mentioned, systems thinking, uh, greater um, uh, consciousness about Eastern thinking, um, deep ecology, well, also maybe a bit later, uh, they all, they don't emerge then, but they become more global debates uh, from that time onwards. So I think they are part of that rethinking uh, and the parts, they need to be put together. I couldn't say, I myself, for instance, I'm, um, but that comes out of certain strands of sociology. I'm skeptical about uh, systems thinking, um, but um, this doesn't mean, I, I recognize that this is part of a, a, uh, a broader rethinking of um, uh, our relation, the relation of humanity to non-human nature and our, uh, our social organization. And these elements, they have to come together. I think one sees them, uh, slowly coming together, but they are still fragments only loosely glued to each other. Thank you, Sai. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you very much. I just have a um, you know follow up maybe question before Sohil, uh, you you uh, you go. I mean, I also wondered about the scarcity. So, um, well, the. First of all, there is a question, of course, the scarcity of what. Mm -hmm. So in a way, when you, in the text, when you make this distinction between the absolute scarcity and relative scarcity, right? So I, I wonder, um, you know, do you have in mind something like a uh, Rawlsian, uh, you know, list of primarily, primary good, primary good, goods. Mm. So, uh, because, I mean, well, Rawls famously, you know, struggles very much with, uh, uh, you know, the question of justice and uh, scarcity was one of the condition of justice for him. So, you know, he tried to define it through this, list of primary goods and for example you know what he calls uh, the foundation for social respect mm. is one of the primary goods so the scarcity of uh, social respect does it really um is it is it somehow included in this or not then in you know phylogenically in um the needs and the scarcity and the concept of scarcity accordingly are probably, you know, changing. Uh, I mean, this Marxist understanding that, well, uh, needs are always increasing. So you never really satisfy the needs. So in this, um, then how it relates then to the, to the climate, to the climate change. So not only the use of the resources, of the concepts of the resources is historically changing, but also the understanding of scarcity and understanding of needs probably changing. Mm. Uh, does it, uh, is, would this consideration add another angle to what you, um, you want to study? So I just wonder, I think it's, it's a follow up uh, to the, to the social question. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maxime. Um, well, I, I guess, uh, I think I can answer somewhat, uh, but I should say at the same time that uh, I don't think I can fully address that question in what I'm doing right now. I mean, what I'm, uh, I think 
I think you're saying that uh, in a way. Uh, there are really two ways of addressing that question. You can either uh, try to um, uh, analytically uh, find out what the forms of scarcity are, the basic forms of scarcity, uh, and then look at social historical situation in that light. Or you can argue this is entirely historical, it's totally context dependent, and whatever human beings see as scarcity is scarcity. Um, I, I think what I'm practically are doing is to try to, um, to bring these two elements together. Um, because um, uh, on the one hand, um, I don't think um, that these philosophical attempts at defining um, primary goods and thus also primary scarcity uh, will ever be entirely successful. I mean, I mentioned food and shelter because there it seems um, blatantly obvious no? that um, if survival is at stake, then um, this is absolute scarcity in some way. But I don't want to make the argument too strong because indeed, as you were saying, it it tends to sideline other aspects like social respect, which may also be uh, primary in some way or other. So, but I think I have to say something on that without developing a full uh, theory of that. On the other hand, uh, I have to do the same with the historical. I wouldn't go as far as saying that whatever human beings define as scarcity is scarcity, because that would suggest that if in current Europe one talks about the cost of living crisis, um, that this is really a question of scarcity. Uh, I think for most people in Europe, it is not. Um, and uh, the uh, trying to see it as, as that, um, is a bit hypocritical if one looks at the global constellation where we have other situations of scarcity uh, which are largely unknown in Europe, at least in Western and Central Europe. So I, I wouldn't allow for an entire historical contextualization either because we have to relate um, understandings of scarcity also to the reasonable understanding of availability of resources. And clearly, if we gave in to certain views of scarcity in the affluent world, uh, then we will never be able to deal with the climate crisis, uh, because then uh, even creating a gasoline tax is already an infringement on an expression of scarcity. Uh, so we, we cannot entirely contextualize and we cannot entirely philosophize to say it like that. We have to, 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 to work with a an ongoing and changing relation between the two. That would be my answer to your question, which I know is not really satisfactory, but that's the only thing uh, I, I can say in relation to at least what, what my current investigation is. Thank you, thank you. Let us take another maybe 10 minutes. Uh, we already, we already uh, you know, ran out of time, but there are some questions both among the panelists and among the uh, attendees. So uh, let, me, uh, let me address now some of the questions uh, at, um, in the chat. So our Renam Shoev uh, is asking now the, well, about the situation uh, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So can it also be related uh, to the pressure of the resource scarcity for Russia well, uh, or other players? Mm -hmm. So is it also a resource crisis in your, uh, in your uh, opinion? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. I, I'm not really entirely competent to answer it. I mean, what we clearly see is... Um, uh, a creation of scarcity for the Ukrainian population now by military means. Um, but that is not really your question. I think, um, but this is speculation. Um, it is really speculative. Maybe I shouldn't be <laughs> saying that, but let me say it nevertheless. I have the impression without fully understanding or analyzing the, the uh, geopolitical situation, I have the impression that maybe one element of the background of the war uh, is also that um, post-Soviet Russia uh, has um, um, embarked on a, uh, an economic strategy which is highly based on fossil fuels, uh, and not only in their own society, but as um, a global commercial strategy to base um, the commercial exchange with other societies on the sale of fossil fuels. And I have a bit the impression that 
the current crisis may be related to um, some degree of insight that that is a dead end strategy and that one needs to do something about this now um, because it is a dead end strategy because other societies uh, slowly and insufficiently but they tend to exit from fossil fuels now paradoxically the war has accelerated this exit strategy but i think something like that was probably in the background and that means not scarcity but um in a dead end economic strategy on the part of russia but it's very speculative so thank others you. know more about this <laughs> thank you thank you uh pizza another another um uh question in the chat uh mariam giovanni again asking what are the practical steps then that we must take as individuals or societies to consolidate these opposing views in attempt to solve the climate and environment crisis yes thank you very much um i think the um the to deal with the opposing views um, is, I think, one step towards that is um, trying to underline that this is a um, persistence and perpetuation of an opposition, which as such as is problematic as long as it exists as an opposition. So um, I think that is the first step to underline this, that um, given the climate crisis, we cannot go on just with these opposing views. Now, to um, uh, overcome the opposition, I think one can only do that concretely. I think my own, uh, since more historical sociological approach is one attempt to do that, to look at historical situations when these opposing views worked and often detrimentally. In the present, I think it would mean to underline, I think I'm thinking of this economist, Philippe Aguillon, I think one has to tell him and ask him, well, you talk about innovation and creative destruction, but show us which are the innovations that are indeed uh, working and solving the issue. I don't think people can give a convincing answer to that. Uh, they, uh, they just talk about um, the endless frontier and innovation in these promising terms uh, uh, without uh, showing that it indeed works. The other way around as well, I think, but that works works better, I think, uh, not overall, but uh, that um, uh, the those who insist on uh, boundaries and uh, want to avoid hubris, they have to show that we can deal with scarcity by other means. I think the whole the whole renewable renewable debate and energy transition is about that. But it also needs to be shown. It needs to be shown concretely. That would help. Both of these steps would help to to overcome the opposition. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andre. you had uh, your hand up, so please go ahead. Yes, if we still have time. Uh, thank you for the lecture and for the subsequent discussion. It was fantastic, and this is a great uh, expose of the global history, I would say. But I have some concern with the final thes the thesis that uh, you uh, proposed, that uh, the uh, significant increase in the fossil fuel use uh, or the great acceleration uh, is caused by the political elites uh, seeking to address the problem, social problems of polarization and inequality and creating welfare state. And to me, uh, this final thesis seems a little bit Eurocentric. So uh, whether uh, the same aspirations can be found in the US, uh, which probably no less uh, expansive in increase of the use of the fuels, but I'm not sure that it is, was as much interested in creating welfare society, and also to what extent this thesis can be expanded to the Eastern Bloc. Because in my view, I guess the greatest increase in the resource use was connected with building military economy. So it was less, less about uh, sort of satisfying population uh, and solving social problems, but more about uh, something else. So just to take these two examples, maybe there are more, but I'm less familiar with them. I'm not sure that it in any way sort of 
challenges your thesis. It just gives a space to sort of diversify. And the second question is, once we accept uh, that the increase in fossil fuel was caused by the uh, sort of desire to address the aspirations of liberation and affluence, so, once we have this crisis, what aspirations do we have as an alternative? Do we have to revert to the idea of survival, to the tackling of the crisis and sort of going back in the use of uh, all sorts of resources in order to save the planet, save uh, the humanity living on the planet, in order not to exceed the planetary boundaries? Or there are some alternative ideals or aspirations or some alternative interpretations on freedom and affluence that can become, become the sort of uh, aspirational force or the motivational force for the cha change. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andre. Um, on your first question, um, no, this is important. What I actually intend to do, but I haven't yet done, um, is um, to look at the, no, let me say first, what I'm, I look at, because it's important as a reference, um, in terms of this, um, this kind of problem solving at the end of the Second World War, is to look at the, uh, the decisions or the, the new trajectory of the first three decades after the Second World War, so from uh, 45 to 75, basically. Uh, that's just as a reference. Uh, and now, um, what I indeed uh, want to look at, um, but haven't yet done, is to look at some non-Western societies um, during that period, especially India uh, and Brazil, um, maybe also take a look at Maoist China, where um, my starting hypothesis is that there were clearly developmental strategies, uh, but they were not, they, they were neither um, as directly fossil fuel based as uh, in the West, uh, nor did they have the same understanding of the social political question to solve, uh, because they remained um, more hierarchical and inequality based. Um, India and Brazil, uh, and China had a different form of accountability of government, Maoist China. Um, so that th there was not that was not seen as the main problem. But now let me come to the US and Russia. Um, I think actually for the US, uh, the US are in a sense a very particular case because the solution was invented there, and it was invented early in the 20th century. Uh, this has to do with the whole frontier history, and um, you know, if you, the the key example, uh, but seen in different light, is uh, Fordism. So um, the decision by Henry Ford to um, uh, enormously raise the wages of his workers uh, so that they can buy uh, the cars they produce themselves. Uh, that, in a sense, is a formula for um, um, uh, the combination of. Um, freedom and affluence uh, that um, the US, uh, at least among whites, was equality based, um, and uh, uh, but it didn't yet quite fulfill the promise of affluence and this connection. It is mostly seen as a crisis of accumulation of capitalism and set capitalism on a new track, but it also set the resource use and the societal self-understanding on a new track. So the US are actually in the background there. Um, it's not welfare state, it's consumer society there, and it is a limited consumer society because um, uh, inequality persisted. Uh, but um, uh, then if you look later at my period, so to say, the US were first of all instrumental in um, uh, making this a an all-Western solution with the Marshall Plan uh, in post-war Western Europe. Um, and they were also, they didn't have the kind of uh, welfare state with, that was developing in Europe then, but it was post-New Deal US. And in the 1960s, there was the Great Society program of uh, Johnson as president. Uh, so um, uh, the US have a slightly different trajectory. It starts earlier, and then it gets less pronounced. Uh, but um, overall, in, in a longer version, I have to... Um, 
devote a separate section to the US uh, particularity there, but I think it can be integrated. Now, the, US, the Soviet Union um, is a different case. Um, I think the, the main problem there, uh, you know, I, I at some point call this, um, um, analyze the embarking on the fossil fuel trajectory at that moment in the West as um, a logic of politics and especially logic of democratic politics uh, that uh, it was to some extent giving in to democratic pressure, uh, even though in the light of the, um, the early 20th century crisis. Now, in the Soviet Union, this kind of crisis was seen to be solved by the Bolshevik Revolution. The social question in the uh, late 19th century sense uh, didn't exist any longer. Now, this doesn't mean that, um, uh, so, but nevertheless, they embarked on resource intensity, as you're underlining. Uh, but they did it uh, without um, the same kind of political problem which the West had in the context of, I mean, certainly way from perfect, but somewhat competitive party democracy. Uh, and in the Soviet Union, I think this only starts later uh, when in the 1960s, when the shift from uh, um, uh, heavy industry uh, and investment and military goods towards uh, increasing consumer goods uh, is done. And it is in, to some extent emulating uh, the West in system competition. But so the Soviet Union is a different story. You're entirely right. Uh, but um, it, I can integrate it into my understanding uh, because I see the earlier Western embarking on this trajectory uh, as um, uh, due to the democratic political constellation, uh, which didn't exist in the same form of the Soviet Union, and the resource intensity of the Soviet Union thus has to be explained by other means. There you are entirely right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, the last we... one about alternative aspirations. <laughs> oh, sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, I had, a, I had a note, but I forgot talking so long about the first question. And the, actually, the answer is shorter because it's vague. Um, I mean, if, for instance, you look at uh, the book by um, uh, Pierre Chabonnier about freedom and affluence, his last, uh, because he creates that connection between freedom and affluence historically in the history of ideas, but he concludes on the need for reinventing freedom. And I think that's not a bad formula, that uh, we need to reinvent freedom and decouple it, at least from that understanding of affluence, which has prevailed uh, earlier on. Uh, and I think, uh, at least um, abstractly, that is entirely possible, uh, because there are um, resource uh, simulations and estimates that tell us that uh, the planet can do well with 8 billion people as it does now, uh, but we have to think differently about resource distribution and resource use. And that would mean reinventing freedom without the close connection to at least material affluence. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Uh, well, this was a fantastic session today. And um, I would like also to, uh, you know, uh, uh, say thank you not only for the panelists but also for all attendees we lost many of them you know during the discussion period but they was uh, they were quite quite a number of uh, people from all over the globe uh, well I at least recognized people from Australia from Canada from Vancouver from Toronto from at least two different uh, two different places from Europe and of course across Central Asia. So this was really, um, you know, global <laughs> global event. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, I mean, no, thank you for you providing the occasion. It was a very stimulating and enriching discussion. So I look forward to continuing it at a later point with uh, hopefully more insights from my side as well.